morning. Pastor Matt gave me a unique opportunity, which I appreciate all the time, to open up and share the Word of God. If you got a bulletin this morning, you see one of my outlines there, right? That's only like a very really partial outline. Somebody was kidding, Matt, when they know when I'm preaching because they see that insert in there and that long outline. But when I was a pastor, that's only half of the outline, right? That usually that I would end up doing. I, I was one of these people, if you taught for a while, that uh, you believe that when people write things down as you're speaking, that hopefully that they are going to remember those things. Uh, before I start this morning, I covered your prayers next weekend. I'll be really leaving to go on a mission trip uh, to Ghana, uh, myself and uh, six others to do an evangelistic campaign with about 20 to 25 different churches uh, over there. We are putting it on a passion play using predominantly the people uh, of Ghana, and uh, I'm going to be reaching out really to many thousands of people, and I've just covered your prayers. And what I'm just doing this morning, I'm preaching a message that I am working on, all right, to preach over there, all right, during this time. So this is almost a message in transition, all right? See how much of it I can get through, okay? How about if we go to the Lord in prayer first? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your goodness. Dear Lord, we were uh, just singing about, dear Lord, that goodness. And dear Lord, the desire which I trust is in all of our hearts that we would know you. But not only know you, but that we would know and understand, dear Lord, the riches of the gospel, all that we have because of your grace. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would live in that reality, that we would live in those truths. I pray this morning that you would take your word, Holy Spirit, and you would do what you only can do, that you would take your truths, your word, and pierce them into our hearts, that we may see our God, that we may see his love, and we may see his great grace. For I pray in Jesus' most precious name, amen. You know, in about a month we will be celebrating uh, Easter, remembering the passion and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I would ask this question, well, what does that mean to you? I know we're having Easter egg hunting. That was great. Always have done Easter egg hunts uh, in my ministry and all these things. But really, what does that time of the year mean to you? You know, to many people, uh, it means that when the time comes, that I die and leave this world, that I have the promise or I have the hope of heaven. And that is good, all right? It's good to know that when you're in your deathbed, that when you close your eyes, you're going to open them up in the presence of the Lord. But the good news of the gospel includes much more. You understand your faith and my faith is not only good for eternity, but it is awful, awful good for right here and now, I still remember, I met Diane, my wife, uh, first year of college, 1964, if I'm right, Bob Jones University. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. was still alive. He was a great preacher of a century ago. And I still remember, here I am, 72 years old, and I remember something that that man said. He was in his 80s at that time, all right, uh, at a chapel, all right, when I was like 18 years of age. That's like, whoo. A lot of years ago, right? 55 years ago. Um, he ended up saying this. Even if there was no heaven, there was no hope for an eternity in a place called heaven, I would still choose to live the Christian life because in all my years in observing the lives of people and in living my life, I believe that the Christian life is the best life there is to live. And I would say amen to that, all right? It is the best life. And I believe Paul expresses that on the verse that I put on top of your outline in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Paul said this, very personal to him. He said, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints. Paul saw himself as a great sinner. And he said, if you're going to have a, you know, a line of those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have tasted of the grace of the gospel. He said, I'd be at the end of that line. And he says, this grace, the grace of the gospel, 
was given to me that I would preach the truths of Christ, all right? And he talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ, that I would have the opportunity to preach those unsearchable riches. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning, truths that we're not only to really to know, but truths that we are to live in, truths that literally should shape how I think, my passions, my hopes, my attitudes, my actions. See, the word gospel, probably most of us here know, it means what? Good news, all right? Good news about our relationship with God. And we're to live in light of that good news. Let me show you an illustration which I believe, probably the best illustration I've heard, that symbolizes or shows what mo how most Christians live. Years ago, over 100 years ago, a rich plantation owner, all right, passed away. And he left $50,000, all right, to a former slave who had served him all of his life. Now, in your mind, if you were at $50,000 back in about 1900, that would be one to two million dollars today, all right? And so, you know, the former slave was called, all right, uh, into the lawyer's office. The lawyer explained to him, we have deposited this money in the local bank. And all you have to do is go to the bank and you can draw from that account Anytime you want, any amount you want, up to that $50,000, all right? Well, a month went by, and that gentleman never went to the bank, never withdrew anything, all right? A uh, lawyer, secretary advised him of this, and he was kind of confused and brought the man back in and asked him, you know, uh, again, I want to make sure you understand, all right, that you have $50,000, all right, in this bank account, that you can go and withdraw from anytime you want. All right, the former slave looked at him and he said this. Do you suppose it would be possible that I could have 50 cents to buy a sack of, a sack of cornmeal? That's what he asked for. Man had no conception whatsoever, because he never handled money, of how much money he had. We have no conception of the riches of Christ or those riches. And I'm going to talk about one of those this morning that means really um, very the guilt of my sins. Knowing that God before God. See, that's very important that we understand. It's very, very active. A kind mind is like one of those push your button up and you feel me pull the reality of guilt. And it is a great exchange. I exchange my righteousness, which is filthy rags, for the perfect righteousness of Christ. And Paul understood that. He wrote it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that I would be made the righteousness of God. And Paul understood this truth, all right? I don't have to live in guilt. I mean, all of us have a past. I, I used to say to my church, if you knew who I was and everything that Bill Hagedus did or thought cross this mind. There wouldn't be one of you in the pews. But if I knew who you were and all that you had done, all right, I wouldn't even care, all right? And I'm saying God knows, right? God knows who we are, right? He knows who we are, but yet he extends his grace towards us and treats us as if we have never sinned, that I am as righteous as the Son of the living God. Now, to fully understand it, I thought I'd make it easy. I'm going to give you bad news and good news. See, I believe this. You can't understand the good news till you understand the bad news. It's like I, I remember hearing this illustration somebody had said one time, it just came to my mind as I'm preaching here, that um, you, know, you send your kids away to college, right? And you're hopefully they're going to study and get good grades and everything else. And they have this practice in colleges, which you should do, all right, is that as a parent, you have the elective of getting their report cards, all right, their transcripts sent to you, like to know what their grades are. Well, girl, all right, it's a college, all right, she knows her parents are going to get, you know, the, the transcript that she flunked, you know, whatever course it was. So she knew this day's ahead, so she put her plan into action, calls up, all right. In fact, I think it was the letter in the story. And you write to her, I got, I got some bad news to share with you. And literally, 
led them down the path, all right, that it almost seemed like she was pregnant. Have a child. And he says, I don't want you to come to the letter. I don't want you to come to the wrong conclusion. That's not true. But by the way, let me add that I did have trouble in one of my courses and didn't pass it. And she had the perception to understand by the time dad was at the end of that letter, he was so happy, <laughs> right, that he paid no attention. So, I, so I'm saying to understand the good news, all right, you need to understand the bad news first. Here's the bad news, all right. The bad news is the Bible teaches us that Adam, first man, was the legal representative of the entire human race. He, he represented all of mankind. And when he fell, all right, committed that first sin, he brought guilt and depravity, all right, on every one of his descendants, all right, all of us. Because of Adam's sin, because of Adam's fall, all people under Adam are, all right, born with a sinful nature. David says it this way, Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. Now understand what David was talking about. David wasn't saying, I sinned in my mother's womb. Baby doesn't sin in the mother's womb. But he's saying, even when I was a baby in my mother's womb, my nature was what? A sinful, that, that was a man, that's who I am. Now, Diane and I have seven kids. Nobody has to explain that to me. I never had to sit down with my kids and say, let, let me teach you how to lie. All right, I'm going to give you a course. Here's how you do it. Man, they do it automatically. Let me teach you how to fight. Let me teach you how, all these things. No, I mean, they were like experts, right? I mean... But they're, they're cute when they're there in that crib, right? But they're experts, all right, in how to manipulate you. And this is what David, what David was saying. Paul expressed it like this in Romans 5, 12. He says, therefore, just as through one man, that was Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And death spread upon all men because all of sin. See, because of Adam... All right, we're born with that nature, all right, that sinful nature. That's my bent, all right? That's what, that, that, that's what I do, all right, naturally. The consequences of his sin fell upon all mankind. Romans 5, 18 and 19. Paul says it again, through one man's offense, that was Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Talking about all of us. Condemnation, judgment awaits from all men. And really the story from Adam to right now, all right, just confirms that truth. It confirms that I have a corrupt, sinful nature. You know how it's confirmed? It's confirmed to my life because I look back at my life and I know that I'm a sinner, all right? In other words, I... I'm not separated from God necessarily because of Adam's sin. Hey, I took care of that myself. I have a sinful nature, all right, because I'm a son of Adam, but yet my condition has been worsened, or really I say confirmed, because of my individual sins and who I am. See, every day I believe we sin both consciously and unconsciously, willfully and unwillfully. Paul understood this, all right, even before he was saved. Understand the mentality of Paul was writing these verses. That's why he's talking about the riches, all right, the gospel, the riches of, of Christ. Paul understood that man is sinful, but he thought in his mind that by religious works, I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to serve God, and I will cancel out that debt, all right? He understood that sin is a debt to God. I need to cancel out that debt. So I will serve God, and I'll cancel out the debt. In fact, I was listening on Wednesday when we were doing the Bible study. You were mentioning a quote by Martin Luther. Martin Luther said it the exact same way, all right? Martin Luther, before he was converted, before he was saved, all right, he thought in his mind that God required of each one of us that we would live the righteousness of God by fulfilling his law. That's why he had a hard time with Romans, all right? Because he thought, listen, I got to keep the law. I got to be this perfect monk, this perfect, in other words, believer, 
and then I'll be accepted before God. But then he'd be reading the epistle of Romans, where in chapter 3, verse 20, it says, no one will be declared righteous in his sight, all right, by keeping the law. Oh, man, he, he had a hard time with that, all right? Because uh, the, the Romans was saying you can be religious, really religious, and be lost, all right? And Paul understood that. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says this, that our acts of obedience fall so far short of God's righteousness that they are considered filthy rags. Now, that's not talking about a rag, you know, in the language. It's not talking about a rag like you dust your TV off. We're talking about like a rag that would be wrapped around a leper, all right, that would have all kinds of, you know, what, all right, on it, oozing from the body. In other words, it's repulsive to Almighty God. And we have to confess with Ezra. Ezra said this way in Ezra 9, 6, our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. So you know what the bad news is? We are in serious trouble with God. All mankind is in serious trouble with God. We're unrighteous. We're unholy. I don't care what family you came from. I don't care what background you come from. Outside of Jesus Christ, we're unrighteous. We're unholy. That's why Paul said, we are children of wrath. Now understand how, why, how, why Paul believed that so firmly. Remember, Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, all right? Paul was thinking in his mind, I'm serving God, all right? I'm serving God by being true to Jude Judaism, by being true to Lord God Jehovah. I am persecuting the church, Jesus Christ, the way, all right? All of a sudden, he comes face to face with who? With God. He comes face to face with Jesus Christ. That's why he says in Romans, we're enemies of God. Paul found out instead of canceling out his debt, man, he has taken his debt to another level, right? I mean, he literally was fighting against God. And Paul understood, all right, really being in this debt that could not be paid. See, our tendency a lot of times, I believe, is to think that, well, my sinfulness is not, I'm not that bad. You know, we'll turn around, we'll look at somebody else and say, well, I haven't done what they have done. And to think somehow maybe my, you know, sin doesn't warrant the wrath of God. That's kind of a hard word, right? The wrath of God. You know, maybe, you know, maybe Hitler deserved that. Maybe, you know, somebody like that, but surely I don't deserve it. But yet I challenge you, read the Word of God. The Word of God teaches that God has a settled Hatred of all sin. I mean, over and over again. He has a just, holy, he is re repulsed, all right, by sin. All sin, he sees, is a direct assault, all right, on his authority. And his essence, man saying, I'm doing it my way. I don't care what your word says. I don't care what you desire. I'm going to do what I deserve want to do. That's why you read the end of the Bible, understand the story in the book of Revelation. It ends, all right, with the Lord and Savior coming, all right, and it warns of his judgment and divine what? Wrath on all mankind who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now let me, let me give you an illustration from a story that Jesus ended up telling. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 18. I don't know if you've caught this, all right? Jesus told a story in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 35, about a king's servant who owed a lot of money, all right? And end up when the king was uh, doing his accounts, he wasn't able to pay everything that he owed. Uh, let me read the verse, and most people don't catch what's going on here, all right? In verse 21, all right, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times? Shall a brother sin against me? Shall I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but up to what? Seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now understand, the king represents our God. One day we're going to stand before him. All right, if we have to answer for our sins, we have to settle accounts. And God's a just judge. Read in the book of Revelation it talks about the books open being judged by our works, all right? 
Now notice what he says. And when he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, but he was not able to pay. See, we read that and go, only 10,000, what are, what's 10,000 talents? I want you to get the perspective of this. One talent in those days equaled 20 years of wages. All right? Now follow me. That means his debt would have taken 200,000 years to pay off. Now, wait a minute. Now, now people of that day, you know, they understood what he was saying. What in the world? How in the world could... In other words, why would Jesus use a debt that large, all right, to tell a story, of a debt that was impossible to pay off, even if the man wanted to pay it off, all right? Why so unrealistic a large amount? Because it represents what? What's he talking about here? The spiritual debt you and I owe. Even if you wanted to pay it, you can't pay it. It's impossible. You could end up, I mean, serve the church. You could be here seven days a week. I mean, Matt, having you do everything. It's not going to repay the debt. And that's what Jesus said. It's the debt of our sins. In other words, literally what Jesus teaches, reconciliation is impossible. Possible. Impossible. All right? There is no way a sinful man can come into a right relationship with God. No way this man can come in a right relationship with the king, all right, uh, of his own. It cannot be done. And it cannot be done in our lives. But praise God, that's where the gospel comes in. Man, if it left you there, that's why Paul, man, he's, that's why Easter, man, rejoicing in what Christ did. Paul understood this. Man, if you understand, in other words, my sin, what I have done, and I do not need to live in that guilt. So let me give you the good news, all right? I like the good news second. Adam might have been a pointed head, all right, of the entire human race, and because of, you know, his fall. And by the way, let's be honest. I used to, you know, read that as a young man and get confused and wonder, Listen, if I was back there, I'd have done the same thing. In fact, I might have given it to Eve, all right? But it ends up that Adam, because of his sin, all right, we all uh, suffer the consequences of a disobedience. But in the same manner, what the New Testament is about is that Jesus Christ came to this earth as God's representative of all those who would put their trust in him, all right? I don't have to live under the consequences of Adam's sin. I can live with the benefits of what Jesus Christ accomplished in his life and on Calvary's cross. See, this is the point Paul was making in Romans 5, 19. He says, for by one man's disobedience, Adam, we're all made sinners. But also by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. This is the basis by which life and death of Jesus Christ becomes effective for us. See, I couldn't live a life keeping the law. But we were in a Sunday school class and we were talking about, if it was amusing, we were reading the book of Deuteronomy and God telling Israel you're going to go into the land. The only thing you got to do is keep all my law. Well, what was that all? <laughs> I mean, no problem, right? I mean, but Jesus came. He lived the life I could not live. And he died the death, the penalty for my sin that I should have suffered. All right? And in him, in other words, I am made alive. It's the basis by which Paul didn't need to live in the burden of sin anymore. And he great, really, really in his life what he had done. Now, he still has the knowledge of sin. Like I told you, I still get, you know, the memory of, the, of sin in, in my life or what I have done. In fact, I believe this, and, and it's bore out in Paul's life, because the, towards the end of his life, he said he considered himself chief of sinners. The more you know Christ, the more intimate you are with him, the more you see yourself for who you are and your sin, and the more conviction and the more you realize of what he did for you. And that's where Paul was. Paul says, the more I knew him, the more I realized how rich I am in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
He no longer had to live in the burden of guilt. Work of Christ was finished. In fact, there was nothing more needed to be done. In fact, I would say this way. Even if something more needed to be done, I, you know, I, in my life when I was a young man, I, I was in the Catholic Church, and I knew everything, you know, really through, my, through the basic doctrines of the Word of God. But I believe by keeping certain sacraments, in other words, I, I was going to gain the favor of God and just earn my way into heaven. But, you know, more I thought about it and say, if Jesus couldn't do it, what in the world am I going to add? <laughs> I mean, there is nothing we can add. If he didn't do it, it's not done and it's not going to be done. But it was done. And we're to live in that freedom and to live, all right, like that, a great place. In fact, not to live like, but almost like I was thinking of this, would be me if I was wealthy. But if you're a minister, you're not wealthy. You understand this, all right? Say Matt was my son. I said, you know what, Matt? I'm going to bless you, son. I'm buying you a new house. You're never going to have to sleep here again, all right? <laughs> and I'm going to, everything you want, right? Paid off, all right? And he has a brand new home. But every month, on the first of the month, He's worried and fretting, am I going to be able to make the mortgage payment? You would say, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> right? I mean, his dad paid the debt. There is no mortgage. For him to live under that guilt would be a fool. And Paul understood that. That's the truth that the Word of God teaches. That's why Paul is saying that I can proclaim the riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the great pictures, all right, of that is the Day of Atonement. You know what is Yom Kippur. If you live around a lot of Jewish folks, you know that's celebrating the fall. This year it'll be in October. And um, each year, all right, got an elaborate system, all right, of sacrifices that he uh, inaugurated for the Jewish people, all right, to remember, uh, uh, again, the lesson of sin, and uh, again, that they would remember the grace of God and their dependence upon him. And it would all climax, in the Jewish holidays, all climax with the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Now, on that day, in fact, you could turn to Leviticus chapter 16. On that day, all right, lots were cast. They took two goats, all right, two young goats. And the high priest would cast lots over those goats, all right? And uh, the goat on which the lot fell, that goat, all right, would be sacrificed. And the high priest would take the blood of that goat and he would go into the holy place, the most holy place. And he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat above the ark. By the way, what was in the ark of the covenant? Ten commandments. What were the ten commandments? That was the covenant Israel made with God. You remember in Exodus chapter 19, Moses came down and says, God said, he'll be your people, all right, and he'll be your God if you will keep all of his commandments. And you remember the nation of Israel? They didn't understand what they are saying, but they, everything God says, we will do. All right? That's the covenant. So when God would look down the covenant, he saw what was required. Then he'd look at the people, and the people what? Ooh, all right? They did not keep what was required. That's why the blood needed to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. So when God looked down, he saw the blood. All right? that the penalty for their sins was covered. So he would sprinkle that blood, and he'd come out, and the people, their relief, he and the high priest come out. But there was a second goat, all right? I want you to read Leviticus chapter 16, what they did with the second goat. And he said, when he had made the end of atoning for the holy place, tabernacle meeting, he'll bring the live goat, and Aaron, who was the high priest, is going to lay his hands on the head of the live goat. So you've got that live goat, the, the one that's left alive. He lays his hands on it. And what does he confess over it? All the sins of the children of Israel and all their transgressions for that year. In other words, symbolically, all the sins of all the people are transferred to that goat concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and the goat is sent in the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And the goat will bear on itself all the iniquities to an uninhabited land and will release the goat into the wilderness. The goat was called the scapegoat. All right? And uh, literally, it foreshadowed our Lord Jesus Christ's coming that he would not only die for your sins, 
but that your sins would be carried away, to be remembered no more. Both goats represented Christ, his work, all right? The one goat that died bearing the penalty for my sins, the other goat bore my sins and took them away from the presence of God. That's why, I don't know if you realize, when you read the gospel accounts and you read on the day Jesus was crucified, all right, why the veil was tore from top to bottom. Because access was made into the very presence of God because your sin and my sin was totally removed from us. And there's several metaphors. I've got to give them kind of quick in the Bible that talks about this so we would understand this. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. How far is that? All right, think with me for a while. If I'm heading north, how far north do I have to go until I start heading south? North Pole, right? If I get to North Pole, then it's going south, right? How about if I'm going west? How far west do I have to go before I'm going east? Here's my catch. You'll never, right? Space. Go east, go west. It's unmeasurable. It's infinite. What is God saying here? He is taking your sins and my sins, all right, an infinite space away from No longer do they bar the access to God. God has restored my position. Remember in, in Genesis that you, Adam walked with God and fellowship with God? You know what that means? I can have the same fellowship with God that Adam had. My sins have been removed. That, that's how far I want that, all right? There's another verse. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he, this is God speaking, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God uses two terms, blots out and remember no more. The blot out means to remember them from record. I remember I used to give the kids at Christmas time a lot. Remember those things that you would write on and as a sketch, right? And you do it. Well, it's like God, man, he just wipes that slate and plus throws the slate away, all right? He, uh, I mean, uh, he just takes care of all of it, all right? It's, it's like Martin, another thing I was reading about when you were talking about Martin Luther, I started reading more, all right, about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, all right, that he had, uh, Satan would try to accuse him, and one day he talked about he had a dream, and that Satan came to him with a long list of his sins. He said, man, I got all these things against you, Martin. And Martin is in the dream. He said, well, is that all you have? No, I got a lot more. All right, beside that. We said, you put them all down and you write on top of them. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. All right? That's what this verse is saying. Blotted out. Think about that. That he has blotted our sin. And he says he remembers them no more. See, there's a difference between forgetting and remembering. See, I forget things. All right, forgetting means that you know, you, your mind becomes a little feeble and you forget certain things. God's not feeble-minded, all right? Literally what this is saying is God has chosen not to bring to his mind anymore your sins and my sins. That means if you bring them up, he'd be saying, what sin? I don't remember that. Whew. No wonder Paul was excited. There's another verse that you probably know, Micah 7, 19. He says, he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You know, it's picturing like if you go to these countries that do fish, you throw garbage over the boat and just sinks. That's what God's done to our sins. He's just throwing them out. They're gone. It's like I remember uh, years and years ago, I don't know how many familiar with Corey Ten Boom, all right? Great story. Um, and it end up that she talked about this, not only threw them in the depths of the sea, puts a sign up, no fishing. Can't bring them back up. They're gone. Let them go. Sin's taken away. No wonder Paul calls his truth unsearchable riches because as he became more intimate with God, he was convicted of his great sinfulness. His conscience would try to accuse him and condemn him, but he did not have to live under a condemnation. In fact, there's a verse I love this. I happen to believe that Paul wrote Hebrews, but... Um, in Hebrews 9:14, it says this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience 
from dead works to serve the living God. Now let me say this. You know, to experience, not everybody experiences what he's talk, what Paul's talking about. To experience that blessing, that unsearchable, it needs to be like the Israelites on the Day of Atonement. Picture in David. That Israel's camped around the great tabernacle. They had chosen those two goats. What was required of the people of Israel? Number one, they need to have an attitude that they were sinners. We did not keep the law. And so they understood that when that goat was being killed, it was being killed for my sin. And when that blood was being sprinkled there in front of the holy seat, in front of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat before it and on it, that it was for my sin. And as they waited, they would wait. And when they saw the high priest come out alive, they were relieved. Why? God accepted the sacrifice. That's what Easter is about. That's Christ came forth from the tomb. God accepted the Father, the sacrifice. And not only that, that by faith, they had to really buy into the reality that when their sins were confessed over that goat, and that goat picture right before them into the wilderness, they believed by faith. Man, I mean, think about it. Does that make sense to you? I mean, over a goat, it's going to take off sins of everybody, and you're talking over a million people? Don't make sense. But God says, this is what's going to be done. And they believed. All right? And by faith, all right, their slate was really wiped clean. And once they knew that, they knew that God's wrath had been satisfied. Sins had been forgiven. Isn't that the story of the gospel? I mean, isn't that what Jesus told Nicodemus, who was a brilliant scholar of the law? Just like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. All you got to do is look and live. All you got to do is believe. And Paul said, man, I was trying to do all these things, all right? And I ended up becoming an enemy of God, but now I'm living in the unsearchable riches of Christ. No wonder Paul would write in Galatians, God forbid that I would glory, except in what? The cross of Jesus Christ. See, the question, you know, I want to say what, what Easter means. See, salvation is not only the hope of heaven. Praise God for that but it's the hope of a new life here. A life not under condemnation. I don't have to live or right, buying into the guilt that Satan would accuse me of, but that I can serve the living God. Question this morning, you've got to ask yourself, in other words, have I experienced that good? That, that's what it's all about. That's why Paul wanted to share that good news with everybody he could. All right? Because it changed his life. Let's every every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. Let me ask this this morning. I know, man, you're here at Potter's Hand, and the Word of God is preached every Sunday. In other words, praise God that we're in a church where we make no apologies for the Word of God, that our pastor proclaims its truth. But maybe you're here. Say, I know in my life you can be here, and you can hear God's Word and yet never have responded. Maybe you're here and you have never experienced that good news. Maybe this morning God's convicted you, brought in your heart. Did you understand, man? Uh, I am in a problem. I am under the wrath of God. I will have to answer for my sins. I have never put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know, this morning you can come to this altar and you can bow your head, bow your knee, and you can put your faith and trust in him faith as a child and you can invite him into your life you can accept his sacrifice on Calvary that he lived the life you could not live and died a death you deserve to die and you can experience that good news maybe you're here when's the last time you ever thanked him for what he's done for you you understand how great the riches are that you're living in he bore all for you See, you, you and I did not make the first move. See, the picture of the of a Day of Atonement is really not really a good picture because God made the first move. Thus, maybe you just need to come to this altar and thank Him. Thank Him for really His grace, for His riches, for His forgiveness, and that you would yield your life afresh and anew 
to serve him. I'm going to ask that we all stand with heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Let this be a time of worship and a time of thanksgiving.